Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Lambert here, four and a half years clean off all substances. I don't take anything. I haven't taken anything this go around and I was successful. Not saying that if you have to take something to survive, that I'm against that. I wanted to talk to you guys about a very interesting show. I just finished it. You guys have got to check it out. And it is The Pharmacist, okay? If you guys have not checked out this show, The Pharmacist, you really must do it. I'm telling you, it's, it is so well worth checking out. I recommend anybody, anybody who has had a loved one or is a struggling addict or knows someone who's a struggling addict, they should watch this show. It's on Netflix, and if you haven't, it's only four episodes. It is absolutely worth every moment, every moment. Now, on this show, I'm going to give you the rundown, okay? So, yes, I guess I'm going to have to if I'm going to go into the content. So, if you haven't seen it and you absolutely must watch the show first, then you need to watch the show before you listen to what I'm going to say. But I want to start off with a few things. The show acts a little bit almost like most of the blame is on Purdue Pharma for the epidemic that we now have. And if you look, the there may be some blame there for sure, okay? Um, but the fact that we live in a society, in a civilization that is constantly consumer-based, it's constantly wanting more. We want more. We want more cheaper. We want more faster. We want it now. And um, living this constant, I like to call black hole, consumer type of life, we're going to feel empty because there's not much purpose. You bought your Lamborghini. Cool. I remember watching uh, Dan Bazillionaire, I think his name is, or something they call him. And he was saying that when he was 16, he all he dreamed about was having a Mustang. He wanted a Cobra Mustang. And he said uh, when he turned 16 or 17, his dad bought him a Ferrari or Lamborghini or something. And he said like if a Ferrari or Lamborghini was a 10, well, he already hit a 10. So now anything that comes after that 10 isn't quite going to meet the the wonder and the expectation that he was looking forward to for more. So he constantly was feeling empty because he couldn't beat the 10. The 10 is the best you can get. So I just, I use that as an example. That's just a rich person's example, but that can go for anyone in any level of society and constantly needing something to fill the void for people who may not be rich. It might be something else. And I remember listening to a speech that was really well done, The Power of Addiction and the Addiction to Power by Gaber Mate. Totally recommend you check that out as well. But in this video, The Pharmacist, it's a father who is a pharmacist. He chose that path as his lifestyle to take care of his family. And he thought, I'm helping people. Like if people are sick, a pharmacist is there to try and help. We have a pharmacist right down the street from us where we live wonderful guy. He really is above and beyond. I mean, he would probably cover a prescription if we couldn't afford it. That's just the kind of guy this is. And this man had a son who died while trying to get straight and buy some crack cocaine one night in a bad part of town, a part of town where, I mean, a lot of people are using drugs and it's just a poor area. So there's a lot more drug use and drug selling to survive in that part of town. Well, it opens this sleeping giant that this father has. This He is on a mission. Once his son dies, it finally dawns on him that his son was murdered. So now he needs to find out who murdered his son. On top of that, there's this huge mystery of how he couldn't have known that his son was doing crack cocaine. And how he had no clue this was going on underneath his nose. He had a lot of learning to do. I say that just to say up front, if your child is, you know, giving off signs you're not sure and you're a struggling loved one or something, reach out, have a conversation, let them know that you love them regardless with no judgment because it will affect anyone. It doesn't matter what race, what religion, what creed, color, what you believe. It doesn't matter. Okay, it'll get you, trust me. And if it does, you need to be able to speak to someone. 
I couldn't approach my dad most of the time because he was living a high expectation life that I could never achieve. And my mom was a straight laced woman. She didn't understand the whole drug addiction thing. I couldn't approach her about it. So if you're a parent, this is my time to say, I recommend you really, really have a heart to heart with yourself first and understand that whatever the news is, don't get mad. Work through it with your child because too many kids are lost. Just like this man from the pharmacist lost his child. But it goes further. So now he is finds the murder of his kid. And he has this constant reminder of children, these young people who are coming in to the pharmacy that are addicted to these drugs, these painkillers. And over and over, he's trying to find out, why are you prescribed such a heavy medication? Remember, he's a pharmacist. He has to know what these medications do to some extent. And this is back when Purdue Pharma was promoting Oxycontin when they were still crushables back in the day. And then, of course, the formula changed. And then eventually, you know, down the road, things start to change. And we'll get there. But he's asking these people who are coming into the pharmacy, you know, who's prescribing this to you? Why? Are, what's wrong? What's the pain? And he's trying to communicate with people, work with them. And there's some complaints that are coming in from these patients that are coming in to get the prescriptions filled to the owner of the pharmacy saying, look, he's like mad dogging me. He's he's constantly probing me and asking me questions. I just come here to get my prescription filled for my doctor that the doctors give me the prescription. It leads down this long trail where he starts to become obsessed. And I would have hated a guy like this when I was in active addiction because he was getting between me and the possible drugs that I wanted to get. Supply and demand. But when you watch the show, you'll see why these guys are very important once you've come onto the side of actually getting your life together and getting clean. Why these people are valuable. Why what he did and why what he was doing was so important. That's coming from someone who's a drug addict, who's recovering, but my mind is completely changed. So watch the show and watch this again, and you'll see where I'm coming from. Now, he has his eyes set on this particular doctor in the local area because he sees the prescriptions that are coming into his pharmacy or his boss's pharmacy, and he recognizes this same doctor's name keeps coming up with all these heavy Oxycontin prescriptions, 40 milligrams, 80 milligrams, And over and over, the same doctor's name keeps popping up. I mean, in comparison, 90 to 95% of the prescriptions that are coming in are coming from this doctor. And it's a lot. It's unbelievable amount. And this is a small pharmacy. So you can't imagine how many other pharmacies are getting this same doctor's prescription, which it ties into the whole pill mill thing. This is when doctors were jumping on board, when Purdue Pharma was sending out their salesmen, salesmen and women, to try and get pharmacies and doctors to push um, to push the Oxycontin. My dad, who's a medic in Special Forces, told me that back in the day, what they would do is they'd go in, they'd send their representatives, and this isn't just for Purdue Pharma, this goes for other medications. Like, let's say it's a cancer or heart disease or something. They will go and they'll send their, their person to a doctor And tell their doctor, instead of you pushing these, we ask that you push this. And if you push this and you meet this quota, we'll send you on a five-day, twice a year, five-day paid-for vacation. Or we'll cut you a check for such and such amount of money if you sell this many, blah, blah, blah. And this is their way of like promoting drugs. You know, might be for a good reason, might be a good medication. But regardless, because there were some bads, bad fruit that hung from the same tree, Um, It caused this problem. And here, Purdue Pharma is doing the same thing, promoting. And these doctors are getting serious payouts from prescribing this, these Oxycontin. Well, his eyes are set on this doctor so much that he starts to go around filming. He's filming the practice. I mean, can you imagine, watch the show. Can you imagine a doctor whose practice stays open Only at nights, right? So she comes in at like 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. And she's open till 2, 3 in the morning every night. What a strange practice. And I'm not talking about like a 24-hour like you have to go into a, a medical center. 
I'm talking about an actual doctor that prescribes you the pain medicine and is supposed to diagnose you and check you and see your vitals and understand x-rays and MRIs and look at you and see if you're really needing to be prescribed these medicines. No, none of that's actually happening. Long story short, it takes everything in the world practically to get this one doctor, to get this one doctor. And as soon as this doctor gets taken out of the picture, all these pill mills start opening up and practices left and right. You guys remember the Florida pill mills? I also interviewed somebody that was on my channel. Owen Culpepper was talking about how back in the day he was making money as a patient going in and he was getting all these scripts in his name and then he would turn around and he'd mail them to get a huge check. And he would do this for a lot of money. And it was going on and on. This cycle of uh, pill mills kept going. Well, they end up getting past that, and then all of a sudden, once all the pharmaceuticals become difficult to get a hold of, now heroin hits the streets, and cartel takes advantage of this. And the Mexican cartel, now they take advantage of it, and it went from heroin, and now we have fentanyl. It's just what happens. Supply and demand. There's a demand for these substances, regardless if the pharmaceutical companies are in the mix or not. There's a demand for these substances from the people. And I think it has a lot to do with the problems that we have as a consumer type of America and never being able to fill a black hole. So we're constantly dealing with mental health issues. We've got a lot of struggling that we have to deal with, I think, as, as Americans. And we've dealt with this same epidemic before multiple times, whether it was Vietnam, whether it was a civil war, uh, back when heroin was right there next to aspirin, you name it. We've dealt with these epidemics over and over, and we're still dealing with them today. So I watched this show, and at the end, everybody's suing Purdue Pharma. And yeah, they, they probably helped a lot in terms of a lot of people's addictions. A lot of overdoses occurred. Today, we don't have the opportunity to play games with the drug that we now have as fentanyl and as powerful and as potent as it is. The scary part is, is you don't even have to be an addict to die. You don't have to develop an illness and become addicted. You can just die. Like, it's not hard to do it. First time, second time, dead. And a lot of people are experiencing that. So it's a scary place to be. And it all starts with us, I think, working as a community of people who are you know, our loved ones and communicating with our families and being close and having a way of communication between each other where we can openly freely discuss these conversations I mean I saw a video on YouTube where the guy says everything we know about addiction is wrong and he talks about how people think it's just the drug itself and no there are people who are addicted to gambling sex food you name it they're not smoking through a pipe and they're addicted and they are and they're finding some escape using something that your brain already has these chemicals you know you're releasing endorphins and your serotonin is being released and things from other ways without having to ingest a drug so the big cure to it according to him and a lot of researchers connection connecting to others connecting to other humans they did the whole rat park experiment and they had the one rat by itself always isolated always od'd and died on the cocaine water or the heroin water but if you put the rat in there with Rat Park, with all the other rats, and there was plenty of sex, food, toys, fun, you name it, they rarely touched that water. They didn't really like that water so much, and none of them overdosed and died. The same goes with humans. I think environment plays a role, but connection in an environment that's suitable. So the type of environment we place ourselves as humans in usually will influence and can affect us on how we are in our addiction. And I know that Dr. B talks about this a lot. You know, other doctors talk about this a lot where they're constantly reminding us that our society is set up for failure. So someone like Dr. B might get someone in treatment for 18 months. 
They get them off the crack, off the meth, off the heroin, IV using. They've now cured them of their hepatitis. They are back, according to society standards, back to a good citizen, if you will. And then what? Release them back into the same vile system and society that they were once in so that they can risk relapse and doing this all over again? Something must change in the society that's causing people to go down that path. And I say, it's tough, but I say open communication with our children and with our loved ones is a good place to begin. Honesty, open-mindedness, willingness. Those are principles that you learn in recovery, but it's a life principle. Stuff you could just be open and honest about. So that way your kid, when they do approach you and say, hey, I'm struggling, you're not yelling at them, but you give them the opportunity to get the help that they need by encouraging them and sometimes having to force that to happen. And that's where enabling becomes a serious situation. Why we can't enable. Tough love is what's going to save them. It saved me. It saves a ton of other people that I know who have made it on the other side because my family was done. They were done playing the games. And they knew that I was already bad off. I had already expressed that to them. So if you're struggling reach out. I put my information down in the description. If you're a family member of someone who's struggling and you're watching this and you're just trying to learn, you're like, you know what? I don't know, but he might be using, or there might be something that I'm not aware about, or he might've relapsed. And I don't know. There's not that communication there. I would try to have that communication and understand prior to going into it that it's worth having that communication and accepting them and not being upset in a way that makes them not want to communicate with you than to get that phone call that they may not be alive or they're in prison or something more, you know, something else could happen. And you didn't have any possible way of helping in any way because they didn't want to open up to you. I know what it was like hiding from my mom and dad, hiding from my wife, not wanting to communicate with them. You kind of are ashamed, but you also don't want them to stop you from doing what you're doing. So, Open communication before it gets to that point, I think is extremely important. That way you're not requiring like the law to get involved in order for your child to even want to open up. And some of you have experienced that already, so you probably relate. We have to speak out about this and continuously get the message out there and try to make changes in our community with programs. One thing I did like about this on the pharmacist show that you'll see is that they they were trying to see if we could use big pharma, all right, Purdue Pharma, the money that they're suing them for towards helping patients that are addicted or people that are addicted to drugs. So towards treatment. Something that'll help people learn how to live life without needing to use substances and to better this park that we live in in the United States and the world. Learn how to better this park, if you will. I use that example since I used the rat park scenario to give us a better chance at making it without having to go back to the heroin water or the cocaine water or the meth water or the benzodiazepine water or the you name it, whatever the substance may be, or gambling, sex, food. Look at our society, you know. We've got a long ways to go. Yeah, we might be a great country. America's an amazing country. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think our problems are quite over yet. And I think if we pull together and we stop criminalizing drug addicts, creating more problems, putting them in a system that is not helping them really repair, rewiring their brain, throwing them into criminal systems where they're becoming more criminals than they were when they first went in a lot of times. Rarely are they coming out different. There's many things I think we could do to to progressively get better with this. And one of the things is cut off the demand. The suppliers can supply all day long. But if the people don't want it, then you now have a whole nother issue where the, the supply, psh, there's no demand. So you have all these drugs for nothing. We're not wanting them. How do we get to that place? 
Comment what you think down in the comment section. Make sure you guys like this. Share this content. I hope you guys hit that subscribe and bell. So that way you're notified if I drop any more content. It's been a minute. I'm getting over this flu. I appreciate you guys being patient with me. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts down in the comment section on how you believe that we can overcome this epidemic of opiate abuse and other drugs, heroin, crack, meth, you name it. I'm interested to hear what you think will be, I guess you'd say, the enigma code being broken and bettering our society. I really appreciate everybody. Watch The Pharmacist, check it out, and let me know what you think. Love you guys.